Hi everyone, Greg Reverdio from Pilot Institute here. And today I wanna to show you how we're gonna use this CX3 to solve some of the questions on the FA private pilot written exam. I know a lot of you struggle with the E6B and if you do, this is probably a device that you wanna give it a little try. You can find these on different websites, on Amazon and other pilot websites. And uh, it's about $100, $120. It's made by ASA. And it's gonna really, really make things a lot easier. Now, the questions that I picked, I picked them from the FAA database. And these questions have to do with wind components, the pressure altitude, density altitude, calculating ground speed, can you calculate in wind correction angle. So a lot of things that students usually have a little bit of a hard time with. And, uh, and this hopefully is gonna make your life easier. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing I want to use this for is our density altitude and pressure altitude. But before we get into this, I want to get a quick reminder of what the pressure altitude and the density altitude is. The FAA in those questions typically is going to give you either a pressure altitude, which is already calculated, or they're going to give you an airport elevation. Remember that your airport elevation, which is called in here, by the way, indicated altitude, your airport elevation, when we correct it for non-standard pressures, we get the pressure altitude, which is our first step. And in our pressure altitude from here, we're going to convert that by using, not convert, but change it by using our temperature. And that's gonna give us our density altitude. The density altitude, remember, is the altitude that the airplane is going to feel like it's flying at. If you're flying at 5,000 feet elevation, this is where I live, and the pressure altitude is 8,000 feet, then the airplane feels like it's flying at 8,000 feet. So the steps in the FAA with the figures that they give you usually starts with converting the airport elevation to pressure altitude using the right side of the figure, and then taking that pressure altitude and then uh, modifying it using the temperature. At that point, we're gonna use the left side of the figure. We can do all of this right here with just a bunch of clicks, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. And the first question that we have for this is this one right here. Determine the density altitude for these conditions. The altimeter is 3035, the runway temperature is 25 degrees Fahrenheit, and then the airport elevation is 3,894 feet MSL. So from here, we have to find out what the density altitude is. So first step, remember, pressure altitude and then density altitude. So let's take a look at the CX-3 and how we're gonna do this. So let's get started first. Let's go ahead and turn on the CX-3, okay? So hold on the button right here in the middle. And then you have different modes up here. Now, if you've used this before, you can see you have an FLT mode, which is our typical E6B mode. We have a plan mode. This is when we do a flight plan with different legs. We're not gonna use this in this video. We also have a timer. We can start the timer, we can stop the timer. Uh, I put it this one actually as a as a back timer, so it's like uh, you're cooking something or you're doing time turns. And then we have a calculator, which is you know just if you want to do some basic math right here, we can use that. I'm going to show you how to use that. And then also we have our weight and balance. I'm not going to use the weight and balance. I don't recommend that you actually use this for the exam because I think it's a little too complicated. So let's go back here to our FLT mode and we're gonna go ahead and find the section that says altitude. And if we go into altitude, now there's some values in here. I'm gonna clear them up using the C button right here. Uh, clear, there you go, so it clears up. That's kind of the downside with the CX-3 that I find when I use it is that it saves those values. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. And then in most cases, I think it's just a little bit of a pain. So just clear them up and then they're gonna come back pre-filled. So we'll just replace them with the values that we want. In here, what we have is looking at the data from the example, it was 300 and, uh, 3,894, so I'm gonna type it again. I can push enter right here, or I can push equal. I'm gonna put equal. And then the barometer, the, the, the altimeter setting, 30.35 push enter again. That gives us our pressure altitude right here. I didn't touch anything, it calculated it automatically. And then here, again, we're gonna enter the uh, temperature, which was 25 degrees. Now you notice it says F for Fahrenheit. If this was incorrect, then we could actually convert right here from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Now it's converting, and I can go ahead, if it were Celsius, 25 Celsius, I would just type 25 Celsius. You can also do it here by doing set unit instead of doing the conversion. 
Um, again, I'm going to go back and I'm going to type 25. Now you notice when I do this, it actually erased everything. I can just press enter, enter, and then boom, here's your density altitude of 2043. If we look at the answers from the question here, we have 2000 feet MSL, which is our correct answer. The next question in here is a little bit different, still related to pressure altitude and density altitude, but now it's going to ask you to think a little bit differently. Let's take a look. What is the effect of a temperature increase from 30 degrees to 50 degrees Fahrenheit on the density altitude? So how is the density altitude changing when the temperature increases from 30 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit? And uh, if the pressure altitude remains at 3000 feet. Now, before you even look at this, think about it in your head. If the temperature increases, what happens to the density altitude? And the answer is the density altitude increases. It gets worse. The warmer it is outside, the more, uh, the, the less performance we're going to get out of the engine, out of the aircraft. So in this case, it's going to feel like we're at a higher altitude, higher density altitude. So we know that one of the answer is going to be that the density altitude increases. Let's figure out by how much it actually increases by looking at the CX-3. So we're going back in here. I'm going to clear this up again, all of the data. Now it's telling us that the pressure altitude stays at 3000. So 3000 equal. And it's asking me, what is it at 30 degrees and what is it at 50? Well, let's type in 30. We find out that it's 1767 feet. You know what I can do here? I can actually go to the M, M for memory, and I can store this value into the memory. You'll see why in a second. The next um, uh, set of uh, uh, temperatures here is 50 degrees. What is it at 50 degrees? So at 50 degrees in 3000, it is 3112, 3112. I'll remember 3112. I'm going to go to the calculator and I'm going to recall 3112. Recall with my memory minus 3112 equal 1345. So we know that it increases. It went from 1766 to 3112. And in this case, it increased by a little over 1300 feet. So C here would be the answer, 1300 feet. The next question is similar to what we just did. And I want you to pause the video and do it yourself. Except in this case, there's two changes. If you read the question, what is the effect of a temperature decrease? So in this case, temperature decrease and also a pressure altitude increase. So two things are changing at this, uh, in, in those two different situations. So what is the effect of the temperature decrease and the pressure altitude increase on the density altitude from 90 degrees Fahrenheit to 1250, that's scenario number one, to 55 degrees Fahrenheit and 1750, that's scenario number two. So let's put in scenario number one and scenario number two in the CX-3, compare the values and see what happens uh, to that uh, density altitude. Back to FLT, FLT, altitude again, and uh, the first, Scenario is 1250 with an outside pressure of 90 degrees Fahrenheit. That gives us 3492. I'm going to store this. I'm going to memory store. And then the second scenario was 1750 and 55 degrees Fahrenheit. 1897. I'm going to remember 1897. Coming back here, memory recall. Minus 1897. So here we can see that we the, the density altitude decreased by how much is the question? And the answer is 1600 feet. Now here's the trick. 1600 feet is not one of the answers, but we have 1700 feet, which is pretty close. And we know it was a decrease. So in this case, this is the closest answer, which you'll see, you'll find out from the FA. Sometimes that's what happens. We get the closest possible answer. And in this case, 1700 foot decrease would be the answer. All right, the next thing I want to use the CX-3 for is doing all of these headwind and crosswind component calculations. And some of them are simple. Some of them are a little bit more complicated. And, uh, and you know how those work. They basically, you have this figure and you have to find where the wind is coming from, where the runway is oriented, and then uh, put the wind speed and uh, then it basically tells you what the crosswind component and the headwind components are. So we can do this with the CX-3 pretty easily, pretty quickly, and also being very accurate. So let's take a look at how we do this with this question right here. And the question is, what is the crosswind component for landing on runway 18 if the tower reports the wind as 220 at 30 knots? So let's go ahead and go to the CX-3 and figure out how we're going to solve this. 
And here, back to the FLT, okay, in the E6B mode, and we're gonna go down until we said win component. Win component, we're gonna start this, and then I'm gonna clear it real quick. I'm gonna clear this as well, clear this. Where's the wind, uh, wind speed? Wind speed in this case is 30 knots. So I'm gonna type this and type equal. The wind direction is 220. You can tell I've been practicing these. And then the runway is runway 18. I'm just gonna enter this and look at that. It gives us our crosswind is 19.28 and our headwind is 22. Well, the question here is crosswind and the answer is 19. The next question is a little bit more tricky because now it's not really giving us all the information. It's kind of going backwards. If you've ever worked these on the diagram, it's a little bit more complex, but let's take a look at the question. Determine the maximum wind velocity for a 45 degree crosswind if the maximum crosswind component for the airplane is 25 knots. Let's think about what it's asking us. It's asking us for the maximum possible wind velocity, so that's what's gonna be the answer. If we have a 45 degree crosswind and the maximum crosswind component is 25. So we're gonna play with the CX3 and we're gonna enter all the answers in here and we're gonna find out if there is one that matches all of these uh, specifications in here. So let's go back up here. I'm gonna clear up all the data and let's, let's enter what we know. And we know the difference between the runway and the wind direction is 45 degrees. So here's what I would do. I would put a runway of 360, which is a runway of north. And if the difference between the wind and the runway is 45 degrees, then we're just gonna make the wind direction from the 045. That's 45 degrees, right, from the runway of north. Now you could have entered really any data in, in here that you wanted. And then what it's asking us is the maximum wind velocity. So if we put a wind velocity in here of 25, okay? If we put a maximum wind of 25, let's take a look at what the crosswind is gonna be. The crosswind is going to be 17. Well, that's still within 25, which is what the question is asking, but let's take a look at the other ones. Let's take a look at 29. 29 knots, it is still within 25, so that's not the maximum yet. And then 35, well, look at that. At 35 knots, we get a crosswind of 24.75, which is less than 25. So in this case, we're safe. 35 knots would be the maximum wind velocity to give us a 25 knot crosswind and a 45 degree angle between the wind and the runway. So as you can see, you have to be creative sometime. You have to really think about what the answer is gonna be and maybe try all the different answers in the question. And here's another example of exactly that where we're gonna be entering all the data. And here's the question. With the reported wind of north, north 360 at 20 knots, which runway is acceptable for use for an airplane with a 13 knot crosswind component, maximum crosswind component? So we're gonna enter the wind information. To, uh, 360 at 20 knots, and then we're gonna enter a runway in here. We're gonna enter runway six, runway 29, and runway 32, and we're gonna see if these uh, generate a crosswind component that is less than 13 knots, and if there is, then that's gonna be our answer. So let's go back up here, clear, clear, and clear. Wind speed is going to be uh, 20 knots. Wind direction is going to be north, 360. You can also enter zero. And then the runway, we're gonna try all the runway. So let's try runway six. Runway six gives us a crosswind component of minus 17. Okay, minus, forget about the minus, just 17 knots. That exceeds 13 knots, so that is not the answer. Runway two nine, which is the other answer. We have an 18 knot crosswind. Again, that exceeds 13 knots. So I can guarantee you that 32, runway 32 is the proper runway. Sure enough, crosswind on this runway is 12.86 which is less than 13, which is going to be our answer. I hope this makes sense. And if it doesn't, please leave a comment and I'll try to help you with this. But that's basically how we're gonna use the uh, CX3 in order to calculate these crosswind components. The next thing is a pretty simple one, and that's one that requires you memorizing a formula, which is gonna be the cloud base. And the cloud base, if you remember, we have to subtract the, uh, the lapse rate, the, uh, the, the, the temperature decrease rate for an air mass, a dry air mass, which is 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet. And then the dew point temperature, which decreases at a rate of one degree Fahrenheit per thousand feet. So that gives us a rate of 4.4. You would uh, use the, um, 
the, the temperature minus the dew point divided by 4.4 multiplied by 1000, blah, blah, blah. You'd have to remember that formula. Well, guess what? The CX3 is gonna help you with this so you don't have to worry about the formula and you can just input the data very straightforward and find out the base of the clouds. So let's take a look at how this works. Here's the question. At approximately what altitude above the surface would the pilot expect the base of cumuliform clouds if the surface air temperature is 82 degrees Fahrenheit and the dew point temperature is 38. All right, let's go to FLT right here. And then we're gonna do cloud base. Look at that up here, cloud base, enter. Outside air temperature, 82 degrees. Again, Fahrenheit, we have the right unit. Dew point temperature is 38. And the base of the clouds above ground level is 10,000 feet AGL. Now a little warning right here, AGL. AGL is the answer that we get from the, uh, from the formula or from the CX3. Be careful, sometimes EFA tries to trick you and they're gonna ask you either the answer in MSL, meaning that the clouds are above another uh, elevation and uh, so you have to just pay attention. The next thing that we can use the CX3 for is pretty cool, which is our time, speed, and distance. Now these questions usually require the use of the back of the E6B, if you've used the E6B. We're gonna use a ground speed, we're gonna use wind correction angle, we're gonna use true course and all of that together. And it can get pretty tricky. With the CX3, it's still not super easy. We still have to go through several steps, but you really have to think about what you are trying to resolve with this question and, uh, and how we're gonna get there. So let me give you the first question here and then we'll work on it together to give you kind of an idea of how to solve this. This one is pretty straightforward. Here's the question. How far will an aircraft travel in 7.5 minutes with a ground speed of 114 knots? So let's take a look at the CX-3 and how we're gonna do this. In the CX-3, let's go back to the FLT right here, and we are going to go to ground speed. Ground speed in this case, because, well, that's the data that we have. The distance in this case is what we're looking for, so I'm gonna clear that up, and then I'm gonna enter the duration. The duration of the flight was 7.5 minutes. Now see the format right here? It says eight minutes and nine seconds. If I do set unit, I can do it in just seconds, in decimals, or I can do it in minutes, which is what I want. I want 7.5 minutes right here, and then a ground speed of 114. I'm gonna enter this. Magic, 14.25 is the distance. Guess what, look at the answers, 14.25. Now, if I had said seven minutes and 30 seconds, then we would have, you could have put 7.5 because you know it's 7.5, but you could have done seven minutes and 30 seconds right here. And the way you would enter this one, you would do zero for the hours, then this right here, and then seven, and then 30. Seven minutes and 30 seconds. That's another way of entering the information. The next question is a bit more tricky. We, the FAA is giving you a lot of information and they're asking you to kind of go through several steps. So let's read the question right here. On a cross-country flight, point A is crossed at 1500 Zulu or 1500 hours. And the plan is to reach point B at 1530, 30 minutes later. Use the following information to determine the indicated airspeed required to reach point B on schedule. The distance between A and B is 70 nautical miles. If you don't have an understanding of what the different types of airspeeds are, you cannot answer this question. So let's do a quick recap. So there's an acronym out there, which is ICT. I for indicated airspeed, um, uh, C for calibrated airspeed, and then E for equivalent airspeed. We're not gonna talk about equivalent right now because it doesn't apply in this case. And then T for true airspeed. And then the last one is gonna be our ground speed. We're gonna start from the bottom. We can, at this stage, figure out what the ground speed is for this scenario. How can we do that? Well, we know how long it takes. It takes 30 minutes to cover a distance of 70 nautical miles. Right here, you can figure out your ground speed pretty quickly. You can actually do this in your head. I'm gonna show you how to do it in the CX-3, but this is something you can do in your head. From here, we have our ground speed. We need to convert our ground speed into our true airspeed, that's the first step. And the way that we're gonna do this is we're going to use the wind. When we know the wind, the wind direction and the wind speed, and we know our true course, then we can actually figure out what our 
um, true airspeed is going to be. And this is what you would do with the back of the E6B. Once we have our true airspeed, then we can go back and convert our true airspeed into a calibrated airspeed, which is going to be by using the pressure outside, because the true airspeed is the calibrated airspeed corrected for non-standard pressure. Once we have that information, unfortunately, the FAA is asking you for indicated airspeed, so we have to assume in this case that the indicated airspeed and the calibrated airspeed are the same or really close to each other. In this case, the indicated airspeed, we would have to have a POH in order to figure this out, or a PIM, and then have a table to convert those two. But we're gonna we're gonna settle for corrected airspeed, uh, calibrated airspeed. So the steps again, three steps: find the ground speed first. Then once we have the ground speed, we're going to use one of the functionality in a CX-3 in order to convert this into our true airspeed. And once we have the true airspeed, then we can convert all of this into a calibrated airspeed slash indicated airspeed. I hope this makes sense. If you don't and you're part of my course on the Pilot Institute, then I want you to go back and watch that video to make sure you understand the different types of airspeeds. And if you're not in the course, well, guess what? It's time to join. So let's get in here. We're going to use three different functionalities. And the first one is we're going to find what the ground speed is. And guess what? We're on ground speed right here. And the way we're going to do this is we know the distance. The distance is given to us as 70 nautical miles. And we know the duration. The duration is 30 minutes. I'm going to play with this format here. 0, 30, and then 0. Equal, oops, what did I do? Here, equal. 140 knots. Again, this is not rocket science. You could have done this in your head. If it takes 30 minutes to do 70 nautical miles, it takes in one hour, you do 140 nautical miles. So 140 knots. Okay, let's go back to FLT. The next step, we need to use the back of the E6B. If we had one, we don't. We're going to be using this right here. And uh, so we're going to go here and I'm going to go to this functionality here called wind correction because we have to convert our ground speed to true airspeed. So let's go back here. Let me clear this up so we don't get confused. Ground speed, well, guess what, 140. And the cool thing about the CX-3 is that the CX-3 actually remembers the data from the previous window, right? We had just calculated that the ground speed was 140 and now it shows up right here at the top as 140. So we're just gonna use 140, press enter, true airspeed. It is given to, no, it's not given to us because that's what we're looking for. So we're going to leave this blank. True course, is that given to us? You bet. 270 is given to us in the example. True heading, we're going to find out in a second. And our wind speed is 15 knots. And our wind direction is 310. We, what happened? Ground speed 140, true course 270, 15 and 310. There you go. 15 knots and 310. So what we were looking for was our true airspeed and here it is, 100 and I'm gonna round up 152. Although this data, because we're gonna go to a different window next, this data is gonna be actually uh, converted directly. So now that we have our true airspeed, we need to convert that into a calibrated airspeed slash indicated airspeed. So there's another window that we need to do this. Three different windows now that we're gonna, uh, three different menus, I should say, that we're gonna go through. So let's go to that one. Back to FLT, we are going to use the one called airspeed. And here's airspeed right here. Once we're in the airspeed, guess what? It brought up our true airspeed, which is cool. And our outside air temperature, well, it's negative 10. I'm gonna type 10 and I'm gonna push the plus minus sign right here at the bottom. Negative 10, 151.8, which was from before. And last thing, we need to put a pressure altitude in here so it can calibrate, use our calibrated airspeed. Pressure altitude is 8,000 feet. That's given to us equal, ta-da, right here we have 137 is our calibrated airspeed. Well, guess what? Look at all the answers. Bam, 137 right here. Again, for this question, you have to do a little bit more thinking. You have to think about what are we looking for and how do we get there? And the way we get there is we're doing ground speed, true airspeed, 
calibrated airspeed slash indicated airspeed. And you have to do it in that order, otherwise you don't get to the answer. And to get to that, we have to go through three different windows. Well, the good news is, if we were to actually do this in our E6B, it would still be pretty complicated. We would have to use the back of the E6B and then the front of the E6B to do uh, the conversion from true airspeed to calibrated. So really not much of a difference. All right, one more of these because I know you want to practice. So I'm going to let you read this one and do it on your own. You can pause the video and I hope actually you're doing all the other ones by yourself as well, trying to figure this out. The only way you'll figure out the CX-3 and the E6B for that matter is by just practicing. So here, I want you to go ahead and read this question and do it on your own. What is the estimated time and route for a 57 nautical mile flight? The wind is from the 100 at 18 knots. The true airspeed is 115. The true course is 217. And you're going to add two minutes for climb out. This is very similar to what we just did a second ago, except in this case, I think it's asking you for minutes for time and route instead of asking you for a ground speed. Same idea. All right, let's get to it. So in here, let's go back to our little trusty uh, right is wind correction right here. I'm going to clear all this up. Ground speed, we don't know. That's what we're looking for. True airspeed, 115. And true course, 217. It's already in here because I just did it. And then we skip this part. Wind speed is 18. Wind direction is 100. And bam, here's our ground speed. Our ground speed is 122.05. 122.05, let's take that into our ground speed calculation. 122.05, here it is. And then the distance was given to us as 57, 57 nautical miles. Here it is, 28 minutes. And if we look at the question, it says add two more minutes to all of this. So now we have uh, 28 plus two is 30. I know you guys are having fun. Let's do one more just for practice. Estimate the time and route, well, how long is it going to take, if the true course is 187 and the distance is 17 nautical miles, the wind is from the 300 at 15 and the true airspeed is 120 knots. Again, pause, do this on your own, and then let's come back to find the answer. Well, let's go back. Now we know how to do this. This is the third time. We're going to go to wind correction right here, and I'm going to clear this up. And uh, let's enter what we what uh, we need. Well, again, we need to find um, we need to find a ground speed. We have a distance. We if we have a ground speed, then we can find time and route. So uh, true airspeed is given to us as sorry, I'm reading the slides here. One two one two zero. The true course is given as one eight seven. And oops. See, don't do equal when you go back to the next one, because here I don't want to enter this data. And then uh, wind speed is 1.5, and the wind direction is 300, 300. All right, now we can do this. Ground speed, 125, and I go back to my ground speed section here. It brought it up, 125, and then the distance was 17 nautical miles. Pretty short trip, 8 minutes and 9 seconds. Well, take a look at the answers. Eight minutes is right up here. I'm almost done. I want to give you one more tip because sometimes you get to the test and you have a brain fart. And one of the questions may be, hey, what is the standard temperature on a standard day? Or what is the conditions on a standard day? Well, you should know 15 degrees Celsius, 2992 inches of mercury. But if you have a brain fart, well, the CX-3 here can help you. Let's take a look how. Go back to your FLT menu right here and go to your standard atmosphere. Standard atmosphere, if we put, I'm gonna clear this up. If I put zero feet right here, enter, bam, 2992. 15 degrees Celsius. It gives you the answer right away. Now here's even better. If you wanted to find the standard temperature at 6,200 feet, you can do this, press enter, and here is the standard pressure and the standard temperature at that altitude. If we did it at 5,000 feet, right here, 2490 and five degrees Celsius is your standard atmosphere. So this is really nifty, it's really gonna help you in case you have to solve any kind of, uh, of problems where it's gonna ask you what your uh, standard temperature, your standard pressure is at a certain altitude, then this is it. 
Okay, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope if there's anything else that you wanna know about the CX-3, I'm ready to do some more tutorials actually on how to use it to do conversions and everything. So uh, watch for those. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. There will be more video coming up to help you with the CX-3 and a ton of other things. So uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments, anything you wanna see covered and then I'll uh, take care of it. All right, happy flying.